Good afternoon, and welcome to the Agilent Technologies fourth quarter earnings conference call. My name is Bethany, and I will be the operator for today's call. All lines will be muted during the presentation portion of the call with an opportunity for questions and answers at the end. If you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. And now I'd like to introduce you to the host for today's call, Parmeet Ahuja, Vice President of Investor Relations. Sir, please go ahead. Thank you, Bethany. And welcome, everyone, to Agilent's fourth quarter conference call for fiscal year 2021. With me are Mike McMullen, Agilent's President and CEO, and Bob McMahon, Agilent's Senior Vice President and CFO. Joining in the Q&A after Mike and Bob's comments will be Jacob Tyson, President of Agilent's Life Science and Applied Markets Group, Sam Raha, President of Agilent's Diagnostics and Genomics Group, and Porig McDonald, President of the Agilent Cross Lab Group. This presentation is being webcast live. The news release investor presentation, and information to supplement today's discussion, along with the recording of this webcast, are made available on our website at www.investor.agilent.com. Today's comments by Mike and Bob will refer to non-GAAP financial measures. You will find the most directly comparable GAAP financial metrics and reconciliations on our website. Unless otherwise noted, all references to increases or decreases in financial metrics are year over year, and references to revenue growth are on a core basis. Core revenue growth inc- excludes the impact of currency and the acquisitions and divestitures completed within the past 12 months. Guidance is based on exchange rates as of October 31. We will also make forward looking statements about the financial performance of the company. These statements are subject to risk and uncertainties and are only valid as of today. The company assumes no obligation to update them. Please look at the company's recent SEC filings for a more complete picture of our risk and other factors. And now, I'd like to turn the call over to Mike. Thanks, Parmeet, and thanks, everyone, for joining our call today. The Agilent team delivered another excellent quarter to close out an outstanding record-setting 2021. At $6.32 billion for fiscal 2021, revenues are almost a billion dollars higher than, than last year. Full year, core growth is up 15% on top of growing 1% last year. The strength is broad-based with our three business units all growing more than 10% core for the year. Our full-year operating margins are up 200 basis points. Earnings per share of $4.34 are up 32%. Let's now take a closer look at our strong finish to 2021 and review Q4 results. Our momentum continues as orders increase faster than revenue in Q4. And at the same time, we delivered our fourth straight quarter of double-digit revenue growth at $1.66 billion Revenues are up 12% on a reported basis. Our core revenues grew 11%, exceeding our expectations. This is on top of 6% core growth last year. Our Q4 operating margin is 26.5%. This is up 160 basis points from last year. EPS is $1.21, up 23% year over year. Our earnings growth also exceeded our expectations. We continue to perform extremely well in pharma, our largest market, growing 21%, driven by our biopharma business. Total pharma now represents 36% of our overall revenue. This compares to 31% of our revenues just two years ago. The strong growth in our chemical energy business continues as we delivered 11% growth in the quarter. This is on top of growing 3% in Q4 of last year. PMI numbers are positive, and we expect that chemical energy will continue its strong growth trajectory into fiscal 2022. In diagnostics and clinical, revenues grew 11% on top of growing 1% last year as testing volume started to recover. On a geographic basis, our results are led by a strong performance in the Americas and China. Our business in the Americas grew 15% on top of 5% last year. 
China grew 8% core on top of strong 13% growth in Q4 of last year. China order growth outpaced revenue growth for the third quarter in a row. Now, looking at our performance by business units, the Life Science and Applied Markets Group generate revenue of $747 million. LSAG is up 11% on both a reported and a core basis. LSAG's growth was broad-based and led by strength in liquid chromatography and cell analysis. The pharma and chemical energy markets were particularly strong for new instrument purchases. Our cell analysis business crossed the $100 million revenue mark in the quarter for the first time. During the quarter, the LSAG team announced a new iMobility LCQTOF and enhancements to our VWorks automation software suite. These new, well-received offerings are used to improve the analysis of proteins and peptides to speed development of new protein-based therapeutics. The Azure Crossside Group posted revenue of $572 million. This is up a reported 10% and 9% core. Growth is broad-based, driven by strength in service contracts and on-demand services, as well as for chemistries and supplies. Our focus on increasing connect rates continues to pay off for us. The strong expansion of our installed base in 2021 and increasing connect rates bodes well for continued strength in our ACG business moving forward. Our ability to drive growth and leverage our scale produce operating margins of roughly 30% up more than 200 basis points from the prior year. The Diagnostic Genomics Group delivered revenue of $341 million, up 16% reported, and up 13% core. Our NASD Oligo business led the way with robust double-digit growth in the quarter and achieved full-year revenues exceeding $225 million. We expect another year of strong double-digit growth as a team continues to do a great job of increasing throughput with the existing capacity. The expansion of our Train B Oligo Manufacturing Facility in Frederick, Colorado is proceeding as planned. We expect this additional capacity to come online by the end of calendar year 2022. Moving on from our other business group updates, there are several other significant developments for Agile this quarter. We announced our commitment to achieving net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. We believe our approach delivers the same rigor and sustainability that we apply to everything else we do. We also believe these actions are not only the right thing to do, but fundamental to achieving long-term success. Our sustainability leadership continues to be prominently recognized as well. You may have seen that Investors Business Daily recently named Agilent to its top 100 ESG companies list. We're also a company where diversity and inclusion represent a company priority and is a core element of our culture. During the quarter, we achieved recognition by Forbes as one of the world's best employers and as a best workplace for women. While the Agilent team has a strong track record of delivering above market growth and leading customer satisfaction, we're always looking to do more. To further accelerate growth and strengthen our focus on customers, we are implementing a new One Agile commercial organization, combining for the first time all customer-facing activities under one leader. The new organization brings together and strengthens our sales, marketing, digital channel, and services team. The new enterprise-level commercial organization is led by Porig McDonald. Porig will continue to lead the Agile cross Lab group as business group president, as well as serves Agilent's first ever chief commercial officer. The way I like to characterize this move is to say we are doubling down on the success we've achieved with ACG, applying a holistic, customer-focused approach to all aspects of our business. We're also moving the chemistries and supplies division to LSAG. This close organization alignment between instrument and chemistries development will further accelerate our progress on instrument connect rates for chemistries and consumables. We believe that structure follows strategy and that this new organizational structure will further enhance our customer focus and the execution of our growth strategies. Looking ahead to the coming year, we are in a strong position to continue to deliver on our build and buy growth strategy. Agilent's business remains strong. 
we enter the new year with a robust backlog and have multiple growth drivers coupled with the proven execution excellence of the Agilent team. A year ago, during our Agilent Investor Day, we raised our long-term annual growth outlook to the 5 to 7% range while reaffirming our commitment to annual operating margin improvement and double-digit EPS growth. We are now one year in and well on our way to achieving these long-term goals. Bob will provide more details, but for fiscal 2022, our initial full-year guide calls for core growth in a range of 55 to 7%. We expect to continue our top-line growth as we launch market-leading products and services, invest in fast-growing businesses, and deliver outstanding customer service. My confidence in the unstoppable One Agilent team and our ability to execute and deliver remains firmly intact. This is our formula for delivering solid financial results, outstanding shareholder returns, and continued strong growth. We are very pleased with our performance in 2021, but not satisfied. As I tell the Agilent team, the best is yet to come for our customers, our team, and our shareholders. Thank you for being on the call today, and I look forward to your questions. I will now hand the call off to Bob. Bob? Thanks, Mike, and good afternoon, everyone. In my remarks today, I'll provide some additional details on revenue and take you through the income statement and some other key financial metrics. I'll then finish up with our initial outlook for the upcoming year and for the first quarter. Unless otherwise noted, my remarks will focus on non-GAAP results. As Mike mentioned, we had very strong results in the fourth quarter. Revenue was $1.66 billion, reflecting reported growth of 12%. And before I get into the details, I want to acknowledge our supply chain team, which has been doing a great job managing in a very challenging global environment. Core revenue growth at 11% was a point above our top-end guidance range. Currency accounted for 0.8% of growth, while M&A contributed half a point of growth during Q4. And as expected, COVID-19-related revenues were roughly flat sequentially and resulted in just over a point headwind to the quarterly revenue growth. Late in the quarter, we did see transit times that were in certain cases greater than anticipated, resulting in some revenues being deferred into Q1. Our results were driven by a continuation of outstanding momentum in pharma and in biopharma in particular, while chemical and energy and diagnostics and clinical also delivered strong results for us. Our largest market pharma grew 21% during the quarter against a tough compare of 12% last year. The small molecule segment delivered mid-teens growth, while large molecule grew 31%. Pharma was a standout all year growing 24% for the full year after growing 6% in 2020. And in FY22, we expect our pharma business to grow in the high single digits. Chemical and energy continue to show strength, growing 11% with instrument growth in the mid-teens during the quarter. This impressive performance was against a 3% increase last year. The CNE business grew 12% for the year after declining 3% in 2020. Growth was driven by continued momentum in chemicals and engineered materials, and we expect our CNE business to continue to grow solidly next year in the high single digits. Diagnostics and clinical grew 11%, with all three groups growing nicely during the quarter. While the largest dollar contributor to this market is DDG, driven by our pathology-related businesses, the LSAG business continues to penetrate the clinical market and drive growth with strong performances by cell analysis and mass spec. We saw mid-teens growth in the Americas and strong growth in China, albeit off a small base. For the year, the diagnostics and clinical business grew 15% for the year after declining slightly by 1% in 2020. And we expect to continue to grow in the high, mid to high single digits in 2022. Academia and government, which can be lumpy and represents less than 10% of our business, was up 1% in Q4 versus a flat growth last year. Most research labs continue to remain open globally and increase capacity to pre-pandemic levels. China came in at low single digits, while the Americas and Europe were roughly flat. For the year, we grew 7% after declining 4% last year. We expect this market will continue to improve slightly in fiscal year 2022, 
and expect growth of low to mid single digits. Food was flat during the quarter against a very tough 16% compare. Europe and the Americas grew while China declined. For the year, food grew 13% after growing 7% in 2020. Looking forward, we expect food to return to historical growth rates in the low single digits. And rounding out the markets, environmental and forensics declined 2% in the fourth quarter, off a of 5% decline last year, as growth in environmental was overshadowed by a decline in forensics. For the year, we grew 5% off a 2% decline in 2020. And looking forward, like food, we expect environmental and forensics to grow in the low single digits in the coming year. For Agilent overall, on a geographic basis, all regions again grew in Q4, led by Americas at 15%, China grew 8%, and Europe grew 4%. And for the year, Americas led the way with 21% growth, followed by China at 13 and Europe at 12%. Now let's turn to the rest of the P&L. Fourth quarter gross margin was 55.9%, up 90 basis points from a year ago. Gross margin performance, along with continued operating expense leverage, resulted in an operating margin for the fourth quarter of 26.5%, improving 160 basis points over last year. Putting it all together, we delivered EPS of $1.21, up 23% versus last year. And during the quarter, we benefited from some additional tax savings, resulting in a quarterly tax rate of 13%, and our full year tax rate was 14 and a quarter percent. Our share count was 305 million shares as expected. And for the year, EPS came in at $4.34, an increase of 32% from 2020. We continued our strong cash flow generation, resulting in $441 million for the quarter, an increase of 17% versus last year. For all of 2021, we generated almost a billion and a half in operating cash and invested $188 million in capital expenditures. During the quarter, we returned $195 million to our shareholders, paying out $59 million in dividends and repurchasing roughly 830,000 shares for $136 million. And for the year, we returned over a billion dollars to shareholders in the forms of dividends and share repurchases. And we ended the year with $1.5 billion in cash and $2.7 billion in outstanding debt and a net leverage ratio of 0.7 times. All in all, a great end to an outstanding year. Now let's move on to the outlook for fiscal 2022. While we are still dealing with the pandemic and we have the additional challenges around logistics and inflationary pressures, we enter the year with strong backlog and momentum. For the full year, we're expecting revenue to range between 6.65 and $6.73 billion, representing reported growth of 5 to 6.5% and core growth of 55 to 7%, consistent with our long-range goals. And this incorporates absorbing roughly half a point headwind associated with COVID-related revenues, with the majority of that impact coming in Q1. We're expecting all three of our businesses to grow led by DGG. We expect DGG, DGG to grow high single digits with a continued contribution of NASD and cancer diagnostics. We expect ACG to grow in high single digits with both services and our chemistries and supplies businesses growing comparably, while LSAG is expected to grow in mid single digits. We expect operating margin expansion of 60 to 80 basis points for the year as we absorb the build-out costs of Train B at our Frederick, Colorado NASD site. And in helping you build out your models, we're planning for a tax rate of 14 and a quarter percent, consistent with current tax policies, and 305 million fully diluted shares outstanding. All this translates to a fiscal 2022 non-GAAP EPS expected to be between $4.76 to $4.86 per share, resulting in double-digit growth. And finally, we expect operating cash flow of an approximately $1.4 to $1.5 billion and capital expenditures of $300 million. This capital investment represents an increase over 2021 as we continue our focus on growth, bringing our NASD Train B expansion online, 
and expanding consumables manufacturing capacity for our cell analysis and genomics businesses. We have also announced raising our dividend by 8%, continuing an important streak of dividend increases and providing another source of value to our shareholders. Now let's move on to our first quarter guidance. But before I get into the specifics, some additional context. Lunar New Year is February 1st this year, a shift from last year when it was in mid-February. As a result, we expect some Q1 revenue to shift to the second quarter this year as customers shut down ahead of the holiday. In addition, as I mentioned, we do expect to see the largest impact of COVID-related revenue headwinds in the first quarter. We estimate these two factors will impact our base business growth by two to three points and are roughly equal in impact. For Q1, we are expecting revenue to range from $1.64 to $1.66 billion, representing reported and core growth of 5.9 to 7.2%. Adjusting for the timing of Lunar New Year and COVID-related headwinds, core growth would be roughly 8 to 10% in the quarter. First quarter 2022 non-GAAP earnings are expected to be in the range of $1.16 to $1.18. And a couple additional points before opening the calls for questions. In conjunction with the new One Agilent Commercial Organization Mike talked about, we will review be reporting under the new structure starting in Q1. In addition, we'll be providing a recast of certain LSAG and ACG historical financials to account for the segment changes after the filing of our annual report on Form 10-K in December. I am extremely proud of what the Agilent team achieved in 2021 and look forward to another strong performance in 2022. With that, Parmeet, back to you for Q&A. Thanks, Bob. Bethany, if you could please provide instructions for the Q&A now. Certainly. If you would like to ask a question, please press star followed by one on your telephone keypad. If for any reason you would like to remove that question, please press star followed by two. Again, to ask a question, please press star one. As a reminder, if you're using a speakerphone, please remember to pick up your handset before asking your question. We will pause here briefly to allow questions to generate in queue. The first question comes from the line of BJ Kumar with Evercore. You may proceed. Hey guys, uh, congrats on um, a nice sprint here and thanks for taking my question. M maybe uh, thanks, my BJ. first one on, uh, uh, Mike, uh, maybe my first one on the guidance here. Uh, a lot of, uh, you know, questions around supply chain, inflationary environment. Uh, the, the guide of 55 to 7% core growth for fiscal 22, uh, what is it assuming for, uh, you know, pricing versus volume, and does it assume any contribution from uh, interest around? I, hey, hey, VJ, this is Bob. I didn't get the last part of your question, maybe? Oh, in Clisserin. Um Yeah, so um, on the on the price we do have built in roughly a point of price uh, into our plan, which was slightly higher than what we had this year, uh, BJ. And um, in terms of inclusion, we won't get into individual customer um, uh, products, but but what I would say is NASD is expecting another growth year, year of very strong growth. And just on, on that uh, last point, uh, Bob, um, maybe uh, Mike, for you, the, the, uh, sure. I think the analyst day outlook had uh, NASD uh, uh, you know, ramping up uh, quite meaningfully. Has anything changed on NASD? Did, did this, uh, you know, capacity ramp up or timing change at all? And uh, I'm curious on uh, no. interest around uh, anything changed post the CRL, uh, you know, response letter uh, to New Orders? N not at all. What I would say, the one big change is the business is doing even better than we had uh, that we had to communicate in December of last year. So I really, really appreciate the question. You know, as you know, I, in my uh, we've been talking about the new capacity coming online, and that's still going right right per schedule. In fact, we just reviewed it earlier uh, last week, uh, and that's due to come on online by the end of calendar 20, 2022. But I think the team has just done a fabulous job, which is we're, we're going to be able to grow double digit. Um, in in 22, even without that new capacity, because they're able to continue to drive process improvements, a broader book of business, and, and larger batches. So the business is really on fire. I mean, we are very very happy with it. Yeah, VJ, if if we looked at our order backlog, we're taking orders for 2023 already. Yeah, 
I, you know, I, was, I mentioned to Bob the other day, VJ, that a year ago we were talking about could you fill up the factory, could it ramp, uh, and we've, we've blown right through that. Yeah, that's fantastic, uh, Mike. And just uh, sorry to clarify, uh, post the complete response letter to Novartis, uh, no change in interest around presumptions for you guys, uh, uh, correct? No, no. Fantastic. Thank you, guys. You're welcome. Appreciate the feedback. Thank you, Mr. Kumar. The next question comes from the line of Tycho Peterson with J.P. Morgan. You may proceed. Tycho? Tycho, we Tycho? can't hear you if you're on. Your line is now open. When we jump to the next in the queue. All right. The next question comes from the line, excuse me, of Brandon Colliard with Jeffries. You may proceed. Hey, thanks. Good afternoon. Um, hey, Brandon. Mike, maybe just. Mike, maybe just starting uh, with the guide for, for next year, just, just kind of talk through some of the variables upside, downside that you considered when building the outlook and be curious what you've embedded for China specifically as well. Okay, so when I talk about the what we see is the potential upside in, in the guide, and, and Bob, maybe you can uh, talk about uh, our China assumptions. And by the way, we hope it came through. We're very happy with the momentum we have in China. I think the, uh, the upside sits with uh, – with our two largest end markets, um, uh, pharma uh, and, and chemical energy. And uh, as Bob uh, indicated in his script, we are assuming high singles, I believe, Bob, for the pharma market, you know, really coming off this toward growth here in, 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 uh, in 2021. Um, that if that high level growth continues, that would represent upside in, in our biggest market. And we've got a lot of really positive things happening in pharma. So I think pharma, I'd say C&E as well, right, Bob? So we've always... Uh, I think this is the most bullish language that I've had in the call for some time about the CNE. &E. So you can imagine there's been even some caution about not over over overplaying it too much. But I'd say the two our two largest end markets represent the the highest uh, you know the, where we think we may have some upside relative to our initial initial first uh, first guide for the year. And Bob, can you remind what what we had assumed for for China? Yeah, Brandon, it's a good question on China, and you know we continue to be very uh, positive on China. If um, if we look at our our backlog. Our order growth rate has has increased uh, higher than our revenue for the last three quarters. We exited 2021 with a record backlog going into 2022 for China, and our, our guidance uh, comprehends high single-digit growth in in China. So, both um, being led by you know our, from a geographic basis, um, growth will be led by Americas and, and China going forward. Okay, and then Mike, in terms of the new organizational structure, um, you know, why why need the COO role now? And then correct me if I'm wrong. Are you planning to collapse ACG into the LSAG segment entirely? Um, because oh, yeah, I kind yeah, of no, thought. No, no. Yeah, no. Yeah. So <laughs> thanks for that clarifying question. So um, let me go, let me let me handle the second part of your question first, which is the ACG group will be 100% services in 2022. And then we're moving, we're moving over the CSD portion, the chemistry and supplies portion of that business over to, to Jacob, you know, for two reasons. One is, you know, just the uh, breadth of responsibilities that, that PERG would have if we had made that change. But we think it's actually going to be a, a, a driver of growth. And, and I'll ask Jacob to make a comment on that here in a second, uh, because we think by having those teams even closer together, we're going to be able to um, – uh, even further accelerate our connect rates on instruments for our chemistry products. Why the change? Hey, it's best to make when when things are going really well. It's really time to put down the hammer and really go as hard as you can. And that's what we're doing here. So as you may know, when I first came in as CEO, um, I had five sales forces. I collapsed those into two. This is the next evolution of that overall. Um, uh, transformation of the company with this one agile and culture behind it. The real belief is that the segmentation of our markets really calls for a much more of a customer orientation as opposed to a product-centric view of how we want to sell and reach our customers. 
And you think about the scale you get with the digital platforms, digital infrastructure, our services organization, this makes sense to do this while you're on top of your game. So um, while things are going well, we thought it was really time to put the accelerator down even further. And, and um, Jacob, if you wouldn't mind uh, just a comment or two of what you're thinking about your new responsibilities. Yeah, thanks for that, Mike. And, and I'm certainly excited. I think that uh, with, uh, with now the CSC, the consumable business being part of it as a key close to instruments, we can truly build those end-to-end -end solutions um, that, that will really drive uh, customer uh, expectations. And I think uh, Corrig and the team have over the past uh, few years actually shown that, that uh, the designed-in consumables that we can really drive a tremendous connect rate. So I think they've already shown the, the path forward and now being CSC completely into LSAG, we can really accelerate that. Yep. And hey, thanks for that, Jacob. And then uh, maybe just to close off this uh, this line of uh, response, uh, Porg, any, any thoughts in about your additional new responsibilities? Yeah, thanks, Mike. <laughs> First of all, really excited about a new role, and I think uh, the unified commercial strategy and organization will really continue to strengthen Agilent's customer fo uh, focus and help us to align capabilities for the future where we're going to kind of maximize uh, connect rate and customer lifetime value. And also, I think, um, accelerate execution of our digital ambitions for to both uh, deliver near-term growth and strategically invest for the future. So very excited and uh, already building on what is a great capability in, in the company. <laughs> okay, that's helpful. Thank you. Thanks, Brandon. Appreciate the question. Thank you, Mr. Collier. The next question comes from the line of Derek De Bruin with Bank of America. You may proceed. Hi, good afternoon. Hey, Derek. Hey, good. Um, just making sure I'm there. So a couple of questions. Um, I guess, can you talk a little bit about the margin expansion? Um, 68 basis points is, is uh, and just sort of tease that out. I mean, you've got some inflationary pressures. You've got some FX. You've got some COVID headwind coming off. Can you just sort of like tease out what's the underlying margin expansion and just sort of normalize it? You also have obviously the, the capacity coming on in Colorado. Um, just how should we think about the margins and just the different pieces? Bob, you want to take that? Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Derek. It's a great question. And, you know, what we've been able to do, you know, even in this last quarter in the face of inflationary pressures is be able to drive pretty significant margin expansion across our businesses. And and so as we think about that 60 to 80, 80 basis points, just to put kind of perspective, we're, we're anticipating roughly 15 basis point headwind associated with that train B um, uh, build up, and that's hiring the people and getting it, the, the product coming online and so forth. And and so if we think about that, that's closer to, you know, 75 to close to that 100 basis points. A lot of that's going to come through SG&A operating leverage um, and the activities associated with uh, just not growing our, our business uh, expenses as fast as the top line. And um, we are going to be cover, looking to cover, you know, some of the inflationary pressures on the top line with that price that I talked about before, which we, we didn't really have enough, you know, any significant price um, in 2021. Uh, we have started to see that we, we took quick action earlier this year to, to reflect that. And so a combination of it, most of it being in OPEX leverage, but there will be uh, some small um, operating leverage at the top line as well. If you take out the, um, or excuse me, at the gross margin, if you take out the um, uh, NASD expenses uh, as a result of covering our costs through pricing increases. Thanks. And then just a couple of quick follow-ups. Um, any evidence of stocking about transportation, supply chains, particularly on um, the consumable side? And just an update on Res Bio that looks like it's still um, lagging a bit for our initial expectations. Thank you. Hey, hey Derek, a uh, follow-up on those two questions. So, uh, and I'll have Sam come in on, on the, the second question. So, uh, we've not seen any real evidence of stocking on the consumables. So I think that's a pretty fair statement, right, Bob? Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Yep. And then um, what you're going to hear from uh, Sam in a minute, he'll find a little bit more color. We remain very, very bullish about the long-term prospects with ResBio and, and a lot of the work that's being done to develop new opportunities with our pharma partners. Um, but uh, we're, 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 uh, where are we on the short term as well? Sam? Yeah, hey, thanks, Mike. Um, you know, in terms of Q4, uh, whereas uh, the revenue came in a little bit below expectations, uh, and, and that's, you know, driven in part by COVID-19-related delays uh, in clinical trial enrollment, you know, overall, the, the interest that we're seeing both from our existing customers on the 
the pharma side that, that we've been doing IHC work with, as well as new customers, uh, it's, that's very, very real. In fact, uh, we've, we've now signed uh, an agreement, uh, you know, which is our first with, with a, a large existing customer giving evidence to the interest that's there. Uh, in terms of the work that we're doing uh, on the PMAs, uh, these are approvals related to existing agreements with, uh, you know, our, our resolution bioscience business. We're making good progress on that. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of momentum in, in, in a number of areas. So very, very pleased to have, have them as part of our business to, to really, you know, bring together the strategy we've had, which is to be the companion diagnostic, you know, development and commercialization partner you know, leveraging, you know, multiple modalities, including immunohistochemistry and next-generation sequencing. Thanks, Sam. Thank you, Mr. De Bruin. The next question comes from the line, excuse me, of Tycho P Peterson. I do apologize. Next question comes from the line of Dan Leonard with Wells Fargo. Okay. You may proceed. Hi, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Dan. Hey, Dan. So my, so my first question relates to the 2022 guide. What are some of the factors that might pull performance back down to the mid-single-digit range, specifically something that would start with a five-handle? Yeah, I, th I think um, I, I, what I would say is, first of all, I, I think our, our guidance is prudent um, given the beginning of the year. Um, if we saw continued, you know, greater than expected disruptions in the supply chain that may impact, uh, um, you know, demand, uh, particularly in, in some of the uh, applied markets, that could do it. Although we haven't seen that to be very no. clear, Dan. Um, we, we feel very good about where we are given our, our forecast and, and backlog. Um, so we're, we're, I would say our, we have bias towards the upside in our forecast as opposed to bias towards the downside. Appreciate that. And then a follow-up on the, the shift in chemicals and supplies from ACG to LSAG. If the logic behind the move is, is to increase the connect rate, can you remind me where is the connect rate today and where you want it to be over some period of time? Yeah, it's a great question, and um, you know the team continues to do a great job uh, under Porg's leadership here to to do that both at the you know purchase and and then on the ongoing aftermarket. What I would say is right now, if you look at the overall attach rate, it's probably in the mid 20s right now. Um, and if you look at the attach rate um, year on year, we saw very nice growth on the on the new placements. Um, so all the new instruments that uh, Jacob and team have been able to sell. You know, that's why we feel very good about the ACG business going forward. So we, we still have a long way to go there in terms of opportunity um, across both the, the services as well as the consumables. Um, some of our competitors are higher than that, and so we've, we've got aspirations that are well above that mid-20s. Yeah, Dan, I'd just like to make sure this clear is we're not making this change because we were dissatisfied with the improvements in our connect rate. This is this, you know, uh, icing on top of the cake to further accelerate it as we look to balance um, you know, span of control and business responsibilities with the, the real driver was the one commercial, creation of the one commercial organization. And I think this is a, a nice secondary benefit that we're actually going to get, we think, even more focus and tighter alignment between our product development groups on the CSD side and instrument side. Helpful clarification, Mike. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Mr. Leonard. The next question comes from the line of Kunit Suda with SVB Learlink. You may proceed. Yeah, hi, Mike. Um, uh, thanks for taking the question. Um, sure, buddy. Bob. Um, uh, thanks. Uh, so, uh, first one is on environmental. I mean, you have a leading position there with um, a number of products across the LSAG, um, LSAG product line. Um, maybe just uh, could you elaborate a bit for, more for us what's going on there? Uh, specifically uh, related to uh, China, the timing in China. Is that just Lunar New Year? Is there uh, something more that we need to consider? 
I think there's uh, maybe I'll start, Bob, and you can jump in on this. So I think when we talk about we talk about environment, environmental and forensics, I think it's a sort of a tale of two cities. So so buried in in, in that number is is a decline in in forensics, and I think that's probably really tied to governments prioritizing other investments uh, in this in this COVID-19 world. Um, you know, the, the demand is just not there. I think relative to to China, it's been more about uh, priorities. Um, you know, right now they're shifting. Uh, some of their priorities towards uh, the pharma and other COVID-19 related type um, investments. So I think that's probably, I mean. Yeah, the only thing I would add on that, Mike, is uh, there is some shift, but it's also timing. Yeah, yeah. yeah so right. There are some. Really, something my first yeah, yeah. There, there, there is some um, budget that we've seen to, that has shifted into, you know, into our fiscal first quarter and, and into FY22, in particular in China. I think long term we still see the the importance of environmental testing um, in in China and around the world remains to be seen or, or, or is still intact, uh, Puneet, um, and it's more a function of of, of timing than anything. Else. Yeah, hey, thanks for jumping in on that, Bob, because we still are very very uh, confident about ability to, to grow our environment bills in, in China. I think it's well known, you know, the the government's real emphasis on continuing to uh, to make improvements in the quality of life of their citizens. Got it. Um, and then uh, just on um, the L uh, on the liquid chromatography, just staying on that point, you know, I really appreciate your comments on on the uh, chemistry columns and consumables now being part of LSAG. But you know, uh, when we look at the business overall today, um, you obviously have a strong 1200 series offering. We're also seeing pickup from uh, another um, leading competitor in the market space that has lost some share over the last few years, and they're Seems like they're they're gaining some back, but just wondering what you are seeing in the field and uh, in terms of further competition uh, in in this uh, side of the market. I well, appreciate any thoughts. Thank you. Yeah, hey Jacob, how about I lead off on here? Uh, and uh, you know, okay. first of all, I want to say is um, you know the key competitors in the LC market remain remain unchanged. There's nobody new in the market, and uh, what I can tell you is that. Uh, we're very, very happy with where we are in liquid chromatography. So we're not playing any kind of catch-up game at all here. Um, we delivered high teens growth in the quarter and exited the, uh, the year with record backlog. Um, with, and our growth rate in orders was significantly higher than our revenue growth rate. Um, and I think, Jake, it's fair to say that the strength is both on the large and small molecule size with uh, with a real standout uh, of uh, China geographically. And I think you exited the year with, with – we see as record backlog, so we're we're really bullish on our LC business, and maybe you want to have some additional comments. Yeah, thanks, Mike. It's, it's something we're really proud of, and and I'm I feel really good where we are right now. Uh, as you said, we are we are growing very strongly, and as I can see when I look into the market, we are we in a very strong position versus our competition also. And just a reminder, we hear a few uh, months ago we did announce that we have expanded our bio LC portfolio substantially. Um, so we really have the full range of, of bio LCs LC out there, but we also have 2D LCs and also online LCs to, to really drive growth in that uh, area. So, um, you know, our bio LC really came timely with all the investment that goes into large molecules right now. So I truly believe we have momentum and we'll continue with that uh, over the next period of time. Great. Thanks, Thanks guys. Jacob. Thank you, Mr. Suda. The next question comes from the line of Patrick Donnelly with City. You may proceed. Hey guys, thanks for taking the questions. Um, sure, Patrick. Bob, maybe one for you. One, one for you to start. Um, just on the margin side, I know you talked about 60 to 80 bips of expansion. <clears throat> you know, it sounds like the NSAD facility might be a little bit of a headwind. Can you just talk through the moving pieces there? I know you called out price a little bit as well. Um, can you just talk about the levers? You know, how much of an offset the facility is, just so we can kind of think about the underlying number as well. Yeah, so I would say maybe on NASD, um, if I look at it and I could break it into two components, if I look at it with the existing capacity, that team not only has driven top-line growth, but if we looked at the margin, it actually is accretive to the overall Agilent margin. So that team has done a fabulous job ramping up. Accretive, right? Accretive, yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
very very nicely. So and so we're making the investment uh, on train B. Um, it's it's roughly 15 basis points. That's abs- in- inclusive of that 60 to 80. So it's a roughly you know 10 10 to 15 million dollars of incremental costs associated with the training and investments um, as the as the lines come on board. And so we're seeing that um, take that to a side because those are kind of discrete. And if I look at the business, what what we're seeing is the faster growing areas. We actually are seeing the benefit of mix. And so we talked a little bit about cell analysis, but also cell analysis in LSAG uh, has been very accretive both on the gross margin as well as the um, operating profit side. And so we've got these faster growing businesses that are helping with, with mix. And then we're adding on the incremental price to cover the uh, inflationary pressures that we are seeing and so forth. But we've also got productivity uh, measures in place. And this is where I think the one Agilent approach to our systems and um, uh, our our infrastructure really pays dividends because we're able to leverage those um, those costs across a larger base. And because a lot of that is internal, we don't have that same level of pressure or cost um, as as we are seeing in some other areas. And, and so it's a combination of product mix, that price. Uh, I talked about 1% price and then um, leverage in the operating expense side. Uh, that's helpful. Thanks, Bob. Um, and then, Mike, maybe one for you on, on C&E. You know, I know in the, in the script sure. you kind of called out, you know, maybe, maybe having the most positive tone you've had in, in a little while here on that segment. Um, you know, obviously the end market health seems pretty high from, from the customers. Can you just talk about, I guess, the conversations you're having there, visibility, you know, again, guiding to high single for next year off, off a pretty strong 21 is encouraging. Um, so maybe just your confidence. And then again, it sounds like maybe there's even some upside to that number. Yeah, sure, Patrick. So, uh, yeah, so we're seeing really good end, end market demand for, and I think Bob highlighted a lot of those, like the advanced materials, the chemicals. It really speaks to the overall um, recovery economically on a, on a global basis. And the fact that this, in particular, this customer base um, um, had deferred a lot of investments for, for, for some period of time. So they're in a, in a, in a reinvestment mode, um, and um, and we have pretty good visibility to to the funnel. So... Uh, I think we probably got at least a six-month lead view on what's coming down on instrument purchases. So um, we're feeling really, really good about the CNE business as well as uh, there's an ACG story here as well uh, of where we're, um, uh, you know, where, where we're continuing to increase uh, services uh, in this segment, which is just historically more of a self-maintainer kind of market, uh, as well as the the, the, uh, the chemistries and consumable side. So. I think we got pretty good, pretty good visibility, uh, you know, given the, our confidence and be able to put this kind of number out there uh, in, in a full year guide at this point in time. Uh, anything else you'd add to that? I know we, I know we spent a lot of time talking about this. No, I think you got it. You, you said it well. Great. Thanks, Mike. You're quite welcome. Thank you, Mr. Donnelly. The next question comes from the line of Josh Waldman, with Cleveland Research, you may proceed. Hi, thanks for uh, taking my questions. Wanted to start with sure, a quick follow sure. up on supply chain. Yeah, hey, 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 Bob. Uh, wanted to start with a, a quick follow up on supply chain. Wondered if you could uh, give us the magnitude of, of the push out you referenced. And is this all LSAG? Let, let, well, let, let, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pass it to Bob here in a second, but let's be really, uh, let me be really clear in terms of our language. When I use supply chain, that means material constraints, and then we have logistics. Um, I think of the issues that Bob, you were high, the, the transit times was really a logistics uh, uh, issue. Where, in terms of our ability to get product to customers and, and and get the raw materials, we feel pretty good about what's been going on there. So, yeah, and, it, exactly. So it was more just longer delivery times. Um, and, and Josh, it was in the LSAG business, uh, as you would expect. Um, and it was. I, it was roughly a point um, in the in the in the quarter. Yeah. Okay, and given the transient nature, it, it sounds like you're assuming this all hits in the first quarter. Is, is that kind of what's embedded well, in your guide? We're we're assuming that it will get better over the course of the first half of next year or, or first half of the fiscal year. So not all of it will come back in Q1. Got it. Okay. Then wanted to follow up on your comments uh, within uh, the LCMS franchise. I believe uh, in your prepared remarks, you highlighted stronger install rates in this franchise in the fourth quarter. 
just just wondered if you could provide any additional color on that maybe what's driving it you know is it is it uh, higher or faster uh, kind of accelerated refresh levels um, at, at legacy accounts or, or maybe you've seen kind of increased win rates at new accounts I'm going to – great question. I'm going to pass that to our expert on this topic, uh, Jacob. I'm going to talk about what's going on on the LCMS front. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. And, and as you mentioned, we, we had great success with our new iMobility, the 6560C, uh, that we launched here at ASMS. And we had a, a fantastic uh, worker and um, a user meeting also that was really all subscribed. Uh, but as you also speak to, we, we had tremendous uh, traction on our triple quad and our single quad businesses. And uh, – and particularly in the biopharma space, we see a lot of, of smaller accounts also coming alive, small mid, uh, mid, uh, mid-sized accounts that, that are starting to uh, build up their capabilities within uh, the analytical instrument business. So we see a lot of uh, tremendous momentum there, but obviously also the big accounts that is more in a refresh mode. Yeah. Yeah, so I think, I think part of the story, Josh, is new, new customers, right, on, particularly on the biopharma side and also doing very well on the refresh side with existing customers. Right. Got it. Yeah, really appreciate it, guys. You're quite welcome. Thank you, Mr. Waldman. Again, if you would like to ask a question, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Our next question comes from the line of Michael Goke with KeyBank Capital Markets. You may proceed. Hey, Mike, it's Paul Knight. Uh, uh, hey, Paul, how are you doing? Time. Good, good. Uh, on the Avantor uh, agreement, um, is there any way uh, you can talk about, does that give you another 5% of the addressable market? What are your thoughts around that deal? Yeah, hey, thank, thanks for uh, noticing that we had worked with Michael's team and and uh, have a really agreement we're really excited about. And uh I'm actually going to pass it over to Angela's new commercial officer to his his view on that question. Go ahead, yeah, Barry. I think uh, yes, thanks, Mike. Yeah, thanks, Mike. I think we're, we see that it's a really mutual uh, beneficial arrangement that we're going to see uh, not only different customers but uh, different uh, spa- different spaces within customers, and it also helps with overall the addressable market and, and coverage. So the Agilent team and the Avantor team will be able to share leads and so on, so we'll be able to cover the market better. We'll also be able to use our digital capabilities to be able to uh, find new customers and also increase the wallet share and customer side. So all around, a very positive development. And, and Paul, it's hard to put an exact percentage on, on the question, but uh, we wouldn't be doing it if it was on the margin. Yeah, and I was going to say, Paul, this is Bob, just to, to add, I mean, we didn't really see any any revenue. That's all future opportunity for us, and I think one of the areas that – Vantor is 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 strong is in the in the research area, academia and government, and this will help us um, even um, you know cover that market uh, even broader than we do today. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. The next question comes from the line of Dan Brennan with Cowan. You may proceed. Hey Mike, hey Bob, how you guys doing? Um, All right, Dan, how about yourself? Thank you, thank doing you. Doing well, doing well. Um, maybe first question on NAAC. Maybe I missed it. Did you guys give a number for 22? What's implied? We did not. We, um, but what we did say is we would expect strong uh, double-digit growth. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, we, we, what I can tell you is we let, we exited we exited at a at a run rate that was higher than the if you if you took our 225 that we talked about and divided by by four, our run rate was higher than right. Them. So we continue to ramp. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks for that question. We were we uh, it was hard to explain it in the call narrative, but the as Bob mentioned, our Q4 exit rate is higher than the the full year number. And maybe maybe could you give a little color there? I think Bob, you mentioned in the prepared remarks or in in, in Q and A that you're taking orders to 23. Could you just give us a sense like what the utilization is today of your capacity that's available and any any color about demand trends, book of business, things of that nature? Yeah, uh, in, in short, we're running 24-7 uh, at both our Frederick facility as well as our, our Boulder facility, which was a legacy facility. And uh, we are um, uh, feel very good about our ability to continue to expand capacity. What Brian and team have been able to do 
is increase uh, both um, throughput uh, as well as yield. And, and so um, that's really helped us drive additional capacity with the existing footprint or the existing um, uh, manufacturing facility. And, you know, the train B, as, as we talked about, has the opportunity to add more than $100 million of incremental, um, you know, volume uh, coming online, you know, starting at the end of this, uh, our, our fiscal, our calendar 2022. Got it. And, and then maybe on the one Agilent, um, Mike and Bob, could, could, could you just give us, I know, um, Mike, when you got there, you, you made some changes to the Salesforce that have been made under your predecessor, and now you're going further. So how should we see this manifest from, you know, the outside over the next, I don't know, one to two years? Is this, could this lead to stronger growth? Is it going to lead to more, you know, better margins, more durable growth? Just obviously the customers are going to see something, but how will that manifest in reported results, do you think? I think it's a I think it's a check for each one of the things you listed there, but the number one reason why we're doing this is to drive more growth. Um and um it's just a natural evolution of, of the transformation of the sales force I started a number of years ago. Uh and it really points to the fact that we have this broad based portfolio that's selling into the same customer base. Um and um why have two separate sales forces and have to go do all the coordination between across sales forces and then the big push that we made over the last several years in terms of digital this will allow us, I believe, to even go faster on realizing our digital ambitions. And then and the, you've got the voice of the customer will be right right in the CEO staff um, and on, on PORG staff, will the uh, head of the service delivery organization. So everything relative to the customer facing that, that we do in, in this company will be under one leader. We just think it's going to find ways to uh, accelerate our growth, um, increase our customer satisfaction. And I think as we push more and more of our business, because customers want to buy that way through digital, it'll have a natural a knock-on effect of, of efficiency gains in the P&L. Great. And then, and then maybe one more. Obviously, balance sheet's in great shape. So the proverbial question about M&A, just wondering, you know, what does the funnel look like? Any update on the strategy? I know you've been pretty um, cognizant of not wanting to go too big here and kind of not disrupt what you built there, but just give us a sense of, you know, what the needs are today and, uh, you know, what is the outlook for, for M&A in 22? Yeah, sure, sure, Dan. So, uh, you know, I've used this, been using this for the last several years of the, the build and, and buy growth strategy. So we're still very interested on the buy element of, of, of uh, uh, fuel and future growth. And, for example, in this past year, we did the Res Bio acquisition, really got us into liquid biopsy and really allows us to, you know, play to our strengths that we already have, from our, our CDX and IHC business. So we're going to look for continuing opportunities such as those where you're in in high, in high higher growth markets than the, the total company average, um, where um, they can really benefit by being part of Agilent and where they have differentiated technology and different t differentiated uh, teams. Um, we, we, we will stay in our lane, so to speak, on, on, on valuations. Uh, it's, I'd say that the and you know this better than I do, perhaps, Dan, the market is still very robust. We're very active, um, and um, we just want to uh, make sure that the deal works for, for our shareholders. But, um, you know, deploying capital for M&A is part of our story going forward. And it's all upside. Great. Thanks, Josh. Excellent. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Brennan. The next question comes from the line of Jack Meehan with Nephron Research. You may proceed. Thanks. Good afternoon. Uh, wanted to, hey, wanted to dig in a little bit more on cell analysis. So heard cleared $100 million in the quarter. What was the 2021 contribution? And similar to the line of questioning on ASD, what's the target there for 2022 growth? Yeah, so I, I'll start with um, you know, the, the cell analysis business, and I'll, I'll bring in Jacob here because um, it, it has just done a fantastic job, and it's really continued the momentum that we saw at the beginning, you know, throughout uh, you know 20. So it ended just just short of 400 million dollars for the full year, and it grew in in the uh, mid 20s. And I would expect us to. Uh, looking forward, if we think about where the market is headed in the, you know, fundamental demand there, that'll be, uh, 
you know, growing double digits for sure going forward. And um, as I mentioned before, the beauty of that business is it it's right in grain with, with where the research and, and technologies are going and where a lot of money is being put in, uh, but it's also an extremely well-run and profitable business for us. And, Jacob, maybe you can give some insights in terms of where are the end markets that you think that are driving – been driving the growth and where do we think it's going to, going to come from in the future? Yeah, thanks for that. It's a, it's a, it's a really good question. Obviously, it's something I'd really like to talk about. The, the selling out business has been super successful the past years, and uh, our focus on the immune oncology space has really paid off. Uh, we continue to see opportunities there, and we continue to see that our portfolio of, of being able to measure live cells is, is uh, required to really drive the uh, uh, the research forward. So where we really see the opportunities is in the between biopharma and also the academic market. There, that's where we see the biggest uh, and the biggest momentum going forward. Uh, while we have seen here the past period of time also that the diagnostic business, particularly with our uh, flow cytometry, is, is is picking up good speed. But I would say the main opportunity sits in the in the biopharma space. Yeah. And Jack, Great. did you ask a question about NASD? Uh, no. Uh, okay. I will uh, uh, continue down that line, just okay. draw on the comparison. Okay. All right. My, uh, You're right, Bob. My, uh, <laughs> my, my follow-up was going to be, you know, a lot of discussion, obviously, around driving growth. Um was hoping to just get your philosophy on CapEx. So, you know, I think the guidance implies about 4.5% of sales for 2022. Uh, that's be higher than you know you've done the last few years do you expect this is going to remain elevated more you know kind of in the medium term or is this you know just kind of some of the near term opportunities coming through yeah um, jack that's a great question and what i would say is if we look at where are uh, th there's different kinds of uh, capex and not all uh, it's not all created equal but it, the reason that it's being increased is really to fund that growth and capacity expansion, whether that be train B and NAST or the capacity expansions in places like genomics and and and, and cell analysis. And I would say, given our growth trajectory in in those areas, I would expect us to continue at you know probably an elevated level to to in incorporate that growth. You know, as as Mike said, we've got this buy and build strategy, and that's part of the build strategy, and and it has paid off in spades with NAST. And what I would say is, you know. We're not, you know, there's more letters in the alphabet than B. It yep. doesn't end at B. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, what I would say is there's, there's, we're going to be prudent about it, but also be aggressive about going forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Meehan. The last question is from the line of Catherine Schultz with Baird. You may proceed. Hey guys, thanks for the questions. Hey, Kevin. Hey, first, um, first on on the LSAG guide for mid single digits. I think on the last call you talked about you know the GC replacement cycle coming back on, maybe being in the midst of an LC replacement uh, cycle on small molecule, and you'll now have chemistries in there as well. So should we think about this as being more towards the upper end of that mid single digit range for 22, or or is there some sort of catch up spend in in 21 that that maybe is a headwind as we get into 22? Yeah, I think you're you're spot on, Catherine. It's it's the former, not the latter. It, it, think about it as a higher end, and that, that's where I would say if we think about where where our opportunities for upside are are in the instrumentation business yeah. and continuing their strong uh, momentum that we've seen. Now we're we're also going up against a you know a I think a 15% uh, core growth rate you know year on year, but we feel very good about uh, the momentum in that business, particularly in the areas that you just talked about in in chemical and energy and, and in pharma. Mm -hmm. We continue to believe that the the pharma business coming out of COVID is structurally a, a higher growth market, um, and as we continue to place our focus on the biopharma or the large molecule. If you look at that throughout, you know, 2021, that was um, much growing much faster than the overall pharma business. And uh, so we would expect that um, uh, we feel very good about that business going forward. Okay, and then maybe one more. Just you've had a lot of success on on NASD. You know, do you have any interest in entering other areas of manufacturing components for biopharma, whether it's GMP reagents or DNA plasmids or other areas? And and is that something that that you might get into in 22? 
Well, uh, Catherine, we're, we're always looking for new uh, drivers of growth that, that would uh, make sense for Agilent to be directly involved in. Uh, so nothing to report for 2022. Uh, we've, got our, we've got our handful uh, adding adding different additional um, letters, if you will, to the alphabet that we serve in NASD, but uh, never say never to, to the thesis of your question. All right, great, thank you. You're quite welcome. Thank you, Ms. Schultz. And the last question is from the line of Noah Berhans with J.P. Morgan. You may proceed. Hey, can you guys hear me? Yes. <laughs> hey, Tycho. Hey, Tycho, how are you doing? It's Tycho. Sorry about the phone issues. Um, no problem. A couple no problem at all. Here. So, <laughs> sure. So, 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 Daco, um, appreciate the, the China color. Obviously, people are focused on you know China tenders at the moment. It doesn't sound like you're flagging any issues there specifically for Daco. But can you talk about what you're kind of seeing on the ground uh, there for China? And then, how big is the CDX business? You, you mentioned that earlier, Mike, and you obviously had a bunch of press releases during the quarter about. You know, new approvals for, for CDX. Yeah, so uh, Sam, I know this is something you've been uh, talking to your team about relative specifically about what may be happening in the China, uh, you know, diagnostics market and, and what's going on there. So we think we've got a pretty good protected position, but uh, why don't you elaborate a bit more? Yeah, happy to, Mike. Tycho, thanks for the question. You know, we, we've had another just overall for our, our pathology business, uh, the, the former DACO business, if you will. Uh, a really good quarter, including in China. And, you know, um, you may be referring, Tycho, to, you know, the buy China requirements that, you know, we're all aware of <clears throat> that, that, that are happening, specifically to our, our former DACO business, if you will. Um, you know, the relative unique position, particularly with PDL1 and, and having uh, a minimal number of local competitors, you know, really differentiates us. So we haven't felt uh, really pressure uh, from, from uh, the buy China impacting our business. Uh, but we, we have continued to see really good interest, not only in, in PDL1 uh, companion diagnostics, but brought more broadly speaking uh, in, in China for, for our diagnostic products. Yeah. yeah, Sam, if I recall, um, you've got your PDL1 uh, registered in China, right? Yes, we do. I mean, we, we registered that uh, almost exactly two years ago, becoming the first ever companion diagnostic in China, and it's, it's doing well for us uh, there in China. We've actually now trained over uh, 400 different pathologists uh, throughout China uh, to, to utilize uh, our, our companion diagnostic. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey, and Tycho, maybe just to follow up, if I looked at our business in China um, for DGG uh, for the year, it grew in the 30s, and it was actually in excess of that for Q4. So, it, you know, it, it had uh, very positive momentum, and CDX is roughly $100 million. X, and, uh, X the ResBio acquisition. Great. Um, and then on cell analysis, you know, Mike, I, I know one of the priorities you've talked about is moving that portfolio downstream. Um, can you talk about, you know, the, those efforts, um, how actively you're looking at kind of pushing that into QAQC and, and further downstream? Yeah, so, Jacob, why don't you uh, follow up uh, with some thoughts here? So, Tiger, when you say downstream, can you, can you say a little more? More in the bioproduction side, you know, versus you know R and D. Yeah. On the bioprocessing R and yeah, so we we see a big opportunity in in the in the bioprocessing space, um, both for for our cell analysis business, but also for our for our analytical instrument business. So, um, I think that is something we will continue to invest in going forward. Yeah, I think what we're seeing right now, Tycho, is moving from, you know, truly, you know, research into the development area, and then that will then lead into the QAQC. So I think you see a multi-step process here. And so we, as, as Jacob said, it's just early days here from that standpoint, um, and uh, but making great progress across all three of those kind of sub-businesses um, and uh, have high hopes for that to yeah. continue. Yeah, we see a similar flow that we've seen in, in pharma for years, right, which is you start in R&D, &R then – and so it works its way into QAQC. Yep. Uh, and, you know, uh, Tiger, I think you know we built this uh, great business through a series of, of acquisitions and the way we integrate into making it one one business. And this would be an area of, obviously, future focus for us on the M&A front as well. Great. Uh, just one last one on the new Agilent. I know you've had a number of questions on, on, on the kind of rollout sure. there. Are there new 
new services you're introducing in conjunction with that? Are you broadening the user service portfolio? Uh, not yet, but stay tuned. <laughs> Somebody that's a few weeks old. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, thanks. Okay, thanks a lot, Tycho. Glad you could get on the call. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. There are no additional questions waiting at this time. I would like to pass the conference back to Parmeet Ahuja for any closing remarks. Thanks, Bethany, and thanks, everyone. With that, we would like to wrap up the call for today. Have a great rest of your day. That concludes the Agilent Technologies fourth quarter earnings conference call. I hope you all enjoy the rest of your day. You may now disconnect your lines.